Well, like I said, I just came back from Nicaragua. There's a picture of what the country looks like. And uh, in Nicaragua, we have uh, two men, or excuse me, not in Nicaragua, but in El Salvador. As we've been going to Nicaragua for two years now, I believe, and that's on the heels of a number of years of ministry in El Salvador with an institute. And we have several graduates of our institutes in El Salvador, uh, Teo Tobar, which I'm sure you've heard that name. We've been praying for him for years, and he's uh, actually on staff, in a sense, of the church here, as we've been supporting him as he uh, takes care of all the organizational things, administrative things, um, as it relates to the Institute, and as, uh, both in El Salvador and in Nicaragua. So Teo, we met him there. Uh, also, we have Nelson Hernandez. He is a graduate of the Second Institute there, and these two men go to Nicaragua five times a year, where they are teaching uh, an institute, a group of men in three different cities. On two or three of those occasions of the five, uh, someone from here joins them. And on two of the occasions, and sometimes three in the year, uh, they are there alone, teaching and going through uh, the curriculum. So these are the two men that we met when we were there. Here is the team, or this is a van that we rented, and we piled ourselves in that and drove ourselves around. Uh, here's the team that went this time. The uh, from, from Duluth is myself and Joan. Joan was the principal translator. She also was the one who kept you updated with the emails, so I'm glad for that, uh, the daily updates. And we left from, uh, we flew, came from Minnesota. Um, here is Nelson and Teo, and they drove from El Salvador, and they drove a car, which, again, can be risky in the sense of the customs, the, the corrupt games that can be played at the borders. Uh, this is Robert Cadena. He has uh, gone on several trips in the past. He is from Texas. He's from Dallas and also in Harlingen. He's, his parents live in Harlingen, so we know him. And so he came as a translator, and he flew from Harlingen and met us at the airport. And then here is a, a woman named Gnarly, and she is a Nicaraguan uh, by birth and actually grew up principally in the United States, but has returned to Nicaragua. as She's a headma- headmaster of a school of 320 kids, and s- her and her husband run this school and she speaks, obviously, very, very good um, Spanish. And so we met her by way of previous institutes uh, or sessions, conferences. She's very favorable, very agreeable, and we thought we'd try her as a translator as well. And so she joined us and, and did an excellent job. And this young lady, her name is Amy. She uh, is from the United States. She is a, an intern at the school that Gnarly is running. She's only been in Nicaragua for a week. She's going to be there for six months. And so uh, Gnarly brought her along asked if that was okay. So that was our team. We had three translators. I was the, the teacher, and we had the two men uh, from El Salvador. So we came from, uh, Gnarly came from an hour away from Managua. Uh, Robert came from Texas. We came from Minnesota, and the other two men from El Salvador. And we, we all met at a roughly the same time in Managua. So that was uh, the grace of God, just, you know, with many potential issues can happen when you're traveling and such. So we all met, and we had our uh, f- um, good fellowship in the evening together. A lot of good conversation and things. Is, okay, that's supposed to be humorous, kind of. Okay, someone got it over there. That was good. Okay, and, uh, and Nicaragua is a, is a great place to go. You know, when you go to Africa and other places, you know, soccer is the dominating sport. But in Nicaragua, what you run across is baseball. So I thought that was really, that was good. Um, our first session is in, uh, on an island. We, we actually go to an island where it's a rather large island, and there's 20-some pastors that are part of the institute there. And so we did three days there. We taught on evangelism, and we went over a series of lessons as well as teaching them the John 3.16 diagram. We gave them plenty of opportunity to practice and to use that on one another and in front of everyone. So this was one of the, the set sessions in this, the smaller group on the island of Ometepe. On Sunday after the conference, we were able to go to a church, and so here's a a church service that we attended. It was very enjoyable. Uh, again, on the island, uh, we gave a, a gospel-oriented message. Then we went on to Managua. So here's a, the group of students in Managua. There is closer to 40 students that are in the institute here and went over the exact same material, again, with them and uh, was able to go with, um, for some reason, just seemed like it went a little better, went a little, more, a little quicker and covered more material this time. So that was, that was good. And um, these are just some pictures of some of the students now and the diagrams and, you know, what they had learned. And they had to present these in front of people or in groups and things. So 
It was, uh, it was very effective. They, they had had some exposure to the diagram before, uh, so they weren't starting from scratch. That was good. And they're just learning how to communicate the gospel in a very um, structured way, a way, a very, a way that you know, makes sense as you go through the context and the content and so forth. And it's not beyond me to shamelessly use pictures of kids to tug on emotions. So here's a, uh, here's a little girl that, that did her diagram, wanted to show us because she had been listening and had, uh, had learned how to do that as well. So. so that brings us to our topic, which is evangelism and what we're studying this morning. And as evangelists, the, what we are to do is we are to carry a message called the gospel. And as we think of the gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is a message of good news from God to man. And we know from other passages and such here that the gospel is a verbal message, a message to be communicated, a message of words. It has specific content. But as we think of the bigger picture, it's a message from God to man. It's a message of God's infinite love for fallen humanity. It's a message of hope where there otherwise is none. It's a message of redemption and freedom for a world lost in sin and degradation. It's a message that cuts against the pride of man and all the religions of man. And this is the message that saves. It's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16 reminds us. This message has a very logical flow to it, which is what we emphasize when we teach. We know it has a context. Context is background information. That which is to be understood so that the message makes sense. In the context of the gospel, we always emphasize, deals with starting with God, and it's the holiness of God, the fact that God is a pure Righteous, just God that has no darkness within him at all. He is infinitely holy and sinless. In light of that, we understand that we're sinful. And as we compare ourselves, especially to God, we realize that we have all fallen short and we are uh, sinners in the hands of God. We're guilty before him. And there's a consequence for that. The consequence of our sin is death or separation. And so we are not fit for heaven. We are not qualified to walk into the gates of heaven because of the nature of heaven and the nature of God's holiness and the problem of our sin. So we have a barrier that separates us between God and man. And that context then establishes a very real need that that barrier could be forever and eternity unless God does something. What does he do? Well, that's the content of the gospel, the good news, that God does not leave us in this state, but he so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. The content of the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ, particularly his death on the cross and his resurrection, where he pays for the penalty of the sins of the world, he pays for all of our sin, and he takes upon himself the wrath of God that was due us. And as a result, he's risen again. God is displaying for the world that he is satisfied with that payment. God is propitiated. And so, therefore, the sin problem has been dealt with by Christ. The good news then is the separation is no longer necessary. So how do we respond? Well, the response to the gospel is is simply this, to believe and to trust that what Christ did for you was enough and to stake your destiny on the work of Christ and therefore not your own works. As the Bible is clear, do not trust yourselves. Do not trust your works. It is faith alone in Christ. So that is the response by faith and not of your works. The result of the gospel then leads to an assurance of salvation. You know that you have eternal life and you will not perish. So you have a guaranteed eternal life and you will never perish. So that's the message we carry across the world. The good news of God to man, that he is not holding our sins against us. Instead, he's provided a sin bearer and it's an issue now putting your trust in him. As we think of the idea of an evangelist, or a, uh, the New Testament calls us able ministers of the New Testament, we are servants. The word there gives the idea of a table servant or a table waiter. And that's what we are as we think of Christians who are saved, who are going to carry the message of the gospel to the world. We don't cook the food, we don't prepare it, we don't um, uh, uh, try to enhance it. We recognize that God is the chef. God has prepared a wonderful offering. It is our responsibility to bring that. We have the privilege of carrying that food to the table of the unbeliever or of presenting this, what God has offered and prepared, 
to them. And therefore, we are to deliver the goods without spoiling it, without dropping it, adding to it, trying to spice it up, or any kind of thing like that. We just faithfully bring that message. And it's not our responsibility to make them believe it, uh, to convince them. God is the one who prepared that meal. And so to be effective, we have to understand we're, we're, we're a table waiter. We're, we're bringing this food out. But as we do, as, as you think of a, a table waiter, it's always good if you get to know your customer. It's good to be aware of them. It's good to know their interests. It's good to know maybe some background things. And so it is with us as we think of uh, the gospel. Uh, it's very good to be aware of those who we want to share this message with to have some idea of their background, to have some idea of what interests them or what uh, trials they're going through, to listen to them and to have some conversations so as to discover perhaps their needs. And as we learn more about them, we then can have a message. We can even uh, be flexible in our message, uh, how we, what we share, what we emphasize. So as we think of this audience awareness, just a few points we'll make before we look at some examples. Um, first, your posture is one of inquiry, desiring to learn about what they believe. So you're asking questions as, as, the, as casually in conversation, hopefully, just about what they believe and what they're trusting in, what they think about God or eternal life, things like that. Uh, it's, there's hopefully interaction. It's not confronting. Uh, it's, it's even um, the idea of just conversation and kind of hearing and learning more about them. Uh, preferably in a personal evangelism, this will be informal, form of a conversation that maybe the Lord allows you to have around a table or in the living room. Uh, if it's uh, with a stranger, we use the survey. The survey works very well in our fair evangelism approach where you are uh, working with a stranger and yet you suddenly are asking questions and having a conversation that can help break the ice and also, again, get their mind uh, spinning, so to speak, on spiritual things. It doesn't really matter how you start that, but the conversation allows you to, to learn some things. Secondly, then, then based, based on what you're learning, you filter that to determine areas of need. You filter that through the context, content, response, result. Um, if they're really not sure about the security of salvation, for example, you know that you might want to emphasize some verses or illustrations or things that might really help clarify the result of the gospel. If they're not really sure they deserve hell, you might clarify or emphasize some things on the context of the gospel and seeing their sinfulness and etc. So now you've filtered this and you have some idea, um, you now tailor your discussion with them in specific ways. And that just means, again, what you emphasize, maybe the illustration, the verses, some of these things. If someone knows they have 10% chance of going to heaven and they're a sinner, you don't need to dwell on the context of the gospel, do you? And you can almost skip that because they clearly understand that and move into different areas that you can emphasize. So this is the idea, and we're going to spend the rest of our time learning from Jesus as we see three examples of how he does just this. And he has a conversation. He pitches and uh, you know, uh, shares what he shares with each one, and it's quite different uh, and unique as it relates to where they're at. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We'll see the beginning of the first one of these three. Matthew chapter 19 <clears throat> is related to what we call the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, beginning in 19 and verse 15, but we're going to start, uh, verse 16 rather, but we're going to start in verse 13 just to make some observations about the context. What is the context? The context is Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. And here we read, The little children were brought to him, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them, meaning those who brought the children. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and then departed from there. So first we see that there's something we want to learn from children here. And in fact, these three verses are what pre immediately precedes the story of the rich young ruler, which begins in verse 16, which means there's something here to observe. There's going to be, again, some comparison as the children are going to contrast the ruler. Well, what is it about children that we can learn? It doesn't say specifically other than this. Jesus says, of such is the kingdom of heaven, meaning the kingdom of heaven consists of people who are like this, these children. I don't think he means that in heaven we're all going to run around like seven-year-olds and, you know, and play tag or tic-tac-toe or whatever. 
No, I think what he's saying here is we're going to have a mindset similar to a child. In what way? Well, children are very naturally needy, and so they're going to be dependent. They need someone to take care of them, to provide for them, to feed them, to clothe them, to shelter them. They are very naturally usually humble. It's not normal to see an excessively arrogant five-year-old, for example. They tend to be more humble. They tend to be needy. They understand that they're relying on someone who loves them and to care for them. And they tend to be very teachable. And you can explain things to them, tell them things, and they will readily believe that, though they are also vulnerable. And so we see that Jesus is saying of heaven, heaven is, is, has people like this who are humble, dependent, needy, trusting, and who willingly come to him. And he didn't want to discourage anyone to come to him. Now, this is just one of several times we're going to see where false teaching of the Pharisees is confusing the disciples as they are products of that. That's all they knew. The Pharisees taught about children that they were really just an annoyance and get them away from me. They didn't really take anyone seriously until they hit their bar mitzvah age or their young adulthood. Uh, Before that, you're just, you know, the duty of women and get out of here. So the Pharisees had a low view, obviously we'll see later, of both women and children. And so the disciples are like, get these annoying brats out of here. And Jesus says, no. No, do not forbid them to come. And again, it's not because he has this excessive love for for children. Like if you show a baby picture, Jesus goes, oh, probably not for that reason. He says, let them come to me because he wants to teach of such as the kingdom of heaven. This is the kind of... um, Uh, thinking or the way approach that one would have that will be consisting of in in heaven. Someone who's trusting and teachable and humble. So, with that backdrop, we then are introduced to our rich young ruler in verse 16, the very next verse. Now, behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is, God. I'm assuming there's going to be a hesitation there. And then he goes on and says, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And so then he said to him, which ones? And we'll come back to that in a minute. So first we see the young ruler. What do we know about him? Well, we know that he's a young ruler as the Bible describes him. We're also going to see that he's wealthy. And he has a question. And his question reveals that he lacks assurance of entering the kingdom. You know, we're going to see he's, peers, he's probably a very confident young man, but the bottom line is he still doesn't know for sure. There's still a, an ache or a void in his soul as far as the afterlife. Though he has a lot of confidence, he seems to just about have it nailed down, but yet maybe missing one or two things. Now, we also can observe that he does not have a real good learning posture, not really teachable. And you say, well, how do, we, how do we know that? Well, notice how he approaches Jesus and says, good teacher. And Jesus says, why are you calling me good? There's none good but one who is God. And as the conversation goes on, we see that the rich young ruler very nicely, completely ignored Jesus' question, never responds to Jesus' question at all. In fact, he did hear it, though. Oh, yes, it's not like he just was so caught up with the moment that he just didn't hear it. No, he heard it. Because in Mark chapter 10, which is the Mark account of the same incident, this time we read how he answered Jesus and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth, when Jesus says to keep the law. What does he call him? Teacher. What does he omit? The term good. So he under, he heard him. There's no question he heard him. But he dropped the title, good, because he's not going to acknowledge that there's one good, even God. He's not going to acknowledge that Jesus is deity. And so he doesn't even say, what do you mean by that, Jesus? Are you saying there's no teachability type conversation here? He just ignores it and blows it off and moves on. So that's what we see about the young ruler. He does not have assurance, and he's maybe perhaps here, not really here to learn. Well, what's his spiritual status? And the answer is, should be obvious, he's not saved. 
Um, it should be obvious, but we have to clarify now, because unfortunately, in the, in the grace, free grace kind of communities, like the Free Grace Alliance and people in, in, of this, in this group and such, are now starting to say that, the, that this rich young ruler was a believer, that he actually is saved. And, and what he's asking for is how can he have his, entrance, uh, his inheritance enhanced when he goes to heaven. And there, there are several problems with that. Um, and the first one would just be that even how he's thinking, he's thinking, what can I do to obtain eternal life? Which is, what can I do is his stressful point. Notice in uh, Matthew 19, as we notice our conversation again, in verse 17, Jesus said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter the life, keep the commandments. And the young man said to him, Which ones? And Jesus then said, You shall not murder, commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is not one of the ten, but it encapsulates the ten. And every one of these commandments, by the way, do not talk about God and having no other gods before you or not having any image in the image of God. They're, none of them are relating to this ruler in God because this ruler doesn't have a relationship with God. This would be a clear clue that he's not saved. All of the commandments are horizontal, and he's using them, as we'll see in a moment, very specifically to reveal, like a mirror, that this young man has a need. But the young man, verse 20, doesn't understand that. In fact, he says to Jesus, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. So come and follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So we'll notice then, the young man is not saved, because one, Jesus, uh, indirectly, we see that he doesn't address any of the divine commandments with him. But really, when you think about uh, a question of of what you're thinking if you're saved in that time. If you're in the first century and you're a Jew and you're saved, as there's as clearly Jews where some Jews were saved, waiting for their Messiah patiently, such as Mary, such as Joseph, such as uh, that knew their scripture. And, uh, and we know that uh, Elizabeth was in that category, Zachariah, Simeon, who was waiting for the, uh, for the birth of Christ, and Anna. And so there were faithful believers that were saved, but they were under the law under the dispensation of the law. So if you were a regenerate Jewish believer of that time, you would understand some things about the law. The law was for you because you're a Jew, but you would understand that the law was designed to show you your sinfulness. And in fact, you would understand Abraham, for example, in Genesis 15, he was justified by his faith. And he was justified by faith, which was counted to him for righteousness. So righteousness comes through faith, not by the law, but the law is the rule of life that God had ordained for the Jew. So you would understand the law as having a place, if you're a Jew at that time, regenerate. The law was the rule of life, but it was not the means in any way of salvation. Does that make sense? And so now, the, the other option would be, if you're unregenerate and you're in that first century and you're a Jew, unregenerate, you would be thinking in terms of the law being a stepping stone to heaven and something you perform and something you do. And which one would the ruler fall in? Which category? Well, he's clearly thinking in terms of something he does, something he has to perform. In fact, he thinks basically he's going to go because he's kept all the law. This again reveals an unregenerate status of his mind and his incomplete understanding. And so we see that he's lacking assurance he is unregenerate. And worse, though, he has a problem of deception. As we've seen, he is very blind to his sin. As Jesus points out these different commandments, the young man said, I have kept all these from my youth. What do I still lack? I have done that. I have kept it all. And so there's clearly a self-righteousness and a blindedness upon him. And he, I, I'm sure he was, I'm, I'm going to guess, if you knew him, he was a very uh, arrogant young man, uh, as he really thought this, that he really basically, you know, has not sinned or not violated the law. And yet, here is this young man, self-deceived, uh, self-righteous, and in Mark chapter 10, and the account again as Mark has it, it says, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. 
Isn't that amazing? That here is a young man full of self-righteousness. And by the way, what is the one sin that God hates the most? According to Proverbs 6, pride. And so here is really a, a very serious, offensive person in front of Jesus and full of his pride, which God hates. And yet it says he loved him. As we're reminded again that God certainly loves the sinner, doesn't he? And he gave, so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. And so Christ loves this young man. And yet he can't make him think a certain way. He can't force him to believe a certain thing. He can only appeal to him or try to reason with him. But he's blind to his sin. So what does Jesus say? Well, go your way. In fact, we go back to the count in Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, and Jesus says to him this, If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. If you want to be perfect. Now, most of us, if we hear that, hear that what would we say? Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying that. No, 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 I'm not saying I'm perfect. I don't believe that I'm perfect. No, no, he doesn't do that. The young ruler does not really protest that. And so what Jesus is doing in the sense of trying to get him to see that he's a sinner, uh, the young man, it, it, it misses him. It goes over his head. Well, he then says about his wealth to sell it. And the wealth is going to be, we'll see, a very key to this young man's confidence to entering the kingdom. And that's why he's sorrowful and grieved. In verse 22, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. And again, this is part of the Pharisees' uh, very uh, wonderful false teaching here, as they would teach very openly that if you were wealthy, this was because God liked you more, favored you, blessed you, and the wealthy were the most likely to have an entrance in the kingdom, to have eternal residence there. It's the wealthy. And so, really, they were the original prosperity gospel preachers, the Pharisees were. And so this young man would have, naturally, then a lot of confidence. He's wealthy. God is favoring him. He is very moral as he's you know, keeping the law in his estimation. And yet, all of this still created a lack. He didn't have assurance. You see, you can try hard, work hard, and accomplish a lot in the spiritual, or excuse me, in the religious realm, but it won't produce assurance. Only a right relationship with the Lord through, through Christ brings that. So he still lacks assurance, though he has a lot of confidence because of his wealth. He connects his wealth to spiritual success. Now, before we go on, I'd like to stop and just say, you know, what would be the typical worldly religious view today of this young man if he walked around uh, a Christian circle today? I mean, today I think we would look at him and say, oh, there's no need to evangelize this guy. Look at him. Look, he's nice, he's proper, he's neat, he's tidy. He doesn't, uh, you know, he's moral, he's clean. Man, what are you doing offending him by talking about, do you know if you're saved? In fact, he's a good catch for any church. I mean, he's got money and influence, he's moral, he's going to look good. Nice car looking parked out in the parking lot, it's going to make the church look good. Don't you dare offend him. But Jesus did so indirectly. As he said, come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the young man went away sorrowful, offended. Because Jesus knew where he was really at. Now let's look at Jesus' approach. Notice what he's going to do. He's going to go for the root. First thing he says to him, why do you call me good? There's none good but the one who's in, but God who's in heaven. He is really going right for the root. You know, young man, and you're going to need to follow me, and you'll never follow me if you don't see who I am. You're going to need to recognize for salvation that I am the one who can provide that salvation. I'm the one who doesn't just answer a question and help you get closer to it. I am the one who distributes it. And you'll need to see that. So you'll need to see that I'm God. Are you calling me God? The young man ignores it, never even addresses it. But he went after the root. He then uses the law lawfully, as we're told. And I'm quoting here from 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11, which is on the screen. We read, Paul writes, We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. 
Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners and for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The first part of that verse, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. We recognize the law was given to Israel, not the Gentile. We recognize the law had specific purposes that God had as it related to Israel. And so we never want to bring from the law, bring that over into the Christian life, or even apply it to the unbeliever. However, there's one way you can use the law lawfully. So there is a way to use it lawfully or correctly for the unbeliever or the Gentile. What is it? Well, these next two big paragraphs would show it is used, it is not made for a righteous person. You can use the law to point out that someone is unrighteous. In other words, you use the law lawfully to expose sin, that you are not keeping the law, that you are not righteous as God is, and so forth. So using the law can, can be done in a right, uh, uh, lawful way to expose sin. And then the last phrase says, all of this is according to the gospel of the blessed God. In other words, this is appropriate in evangelism and sharing the gospel to use the law lawfully. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He uses the law and he points out some of the law and the young man should have said, oh yeah, I don't really do that, do I? Unfortunately, he's extremely deceived And it didn't get anywhere with this young man. But he uses the law lawfully to get him to see the holiness of God. Thirdly, we see that Jesus seeks to undermine what the young ruler is trusting. And what is the young ruler trusting? Well, we know that's uh, clear in verse 21. uh, Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Something far better than treasure on earth, treasure in heaven. And the young man shook his head and went away. In other words, Jesus is saying, you know, by following me, that'll never happen unless you believe. You're going to need to understand who I am as far as being God, and you're going to need to uh, put your trust in what I can do by way of who I am, by way of even bringing you into the entrance of the kingdom. You see, Jesus transcends all earthly treasures and riches, as we even saw in the middle hour. He transcends that. He's above and beyond all of our social statuses, economic statuses, wealth, and so forth. He's something far better. Do you have an eye for a treasure in heaven, he says. And the young man replies with his feet, and he says, no, I do not. And so he's hanging on to his earthly privileges, his earthly luxuries or advantages, and all that he thought that that was doing for him. He wanted assurance because that didn't give him assurance but he's not really willing to let that go. He's hanging on to that, and Jesus is seeking to undermine that. Treasure in heaven is far greater than treasure in earth. You're trusting the wrong thing. And the young man goes away sorrowful. Jesus gives him no further light. Instead, he uses the opportunity to instruct his disciples. Notice their response in verse 23, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Really, a camel can't get through the eye of a needle, right? It's impossible. And that's why the disciples heard it. They were greatly astonished, verse 25. It's a word of extreme emotion. They were blown away, saying, Who then can be saved? Now, why would they say that? except they're products of the false teaching that they've been exposed to from the Pharisees, that the rich go to heaven, the rich are blessed, the rich are the most likely candidates, etc. So this, Jesus uses the young ruler's rejection as a way to teach and clarify to his own disciples. He gives him no further light. You know, sadly, John MacArthur and others who... uh, promote the lordship salvation position, they'll turn to this passage and say, this is the best evangelistic passage in the New Testament. And the reason they are so attracted to this is because the young ruler was called upon to follow and to give it all away and to give up and be obedient and follow as they describe faith as being one of 
unrestricted obedience to the Lord. Unflinching yieldedness to Jesus Christ. That's what it takes. If that's true, then it would beg some questions. I mean, if that is true, that I have to be willing to give everything up and be fully yielded and obedient to the Lord. In fact, if I asked you, those who are preaching this, are you saved? And you know what they'd all say. Well, yes, I'm, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus and I'm following him. You'd have to pause and say, really? How are you different than the rich young ruler here? I mean, have you always been unquenching and and just totally yielded to the Lord since you got saved? Will you always be faithful in every case? You're just the same. You see that? As the young ruler. In fact, that kind of teaching really is what produces men like this young ruler. Was following Jesus an unflinching uh, obedience to him, was that really the central issue? It's not even the issue here. What Jesus is seeking to bring out, the first issue is, I'm God. Will you recognize that? The second issue he's bringing out, you're a sinner. Will you recognize that? Third issue is, you need to trust me, not your riches. And all three of those issues, the young ruler it went over his head. What is Jesus addressing here as we think of the gospel? The context, isn't he? The context of the gospel. The holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and this young ruler would have none of it. He didn't get it. So does Jesus go on and on and lay more pearls before him? No. He loved him, though. And he, he gave him several different angles and things in terms of conversation to get his mind going and to show him. But he instead used it as a teachable moment for his disciples. Let's turn to John chapter 3. We see a second example of Jesus and his conversations. And as we see them, we can begin to see the differences in how he's approaching different people in light of different circumstances. John chapter 3 is the famous story of Nicodemus approaching Jesus by night. John 3 1 says there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews. So, as we think of our context, our context is a conversation between a Jewish leader and Jesus at night. As we see in verse 2, he came to Jesus by night. So, we have a Jewish leader coming to visit Jesus at night. And so, let's learn some things about that Jewish leader. Let's just jot a few notes down about Nicodemus. Uh, one, it says he's a Pharisee, which means he's an Old Testament scholar. He knows his Bible, or he should as a Pharisee. They were very meticulous on their uh, Old Testament scriptures and their knowledge. He also would have been well-educated then. Secondly, he's a ruler of the Jews, which would indicate a political place of privilege. So he's a, a real genuine leader, both in the religious sense and in the political realm in, in Jerusalem. Has some privilege, has some power. Thirdly, we're going to see that he comes to Jesus at night alone. And notice what he says to him in verse 2. He comes to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's indicating, hey, I know that God is with you. Now that's a very bold statement because almost all the other Pharisees we encounter do not think that about Jesus Christ. They think that he is a bad man, an imposter, who should be eliminated. So Nicodemus is different as he sees something favorable and positive about Jesus, though he does not understand him. He comes at night and he inquires of him. How does Jesus approach him? Again, we see he's going to go for the root. The conversation is immediate. In verse 3, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes right for the jugular. Not combative, but he states it very clearly. Nicodemus, your first birth is of no value. You need a second birth. 
And this is a profound statement to a proud Jew who would have a lot invested in his first birth, who was invested in a religious system that his birth introduced him to. He was a Jew of the covenant people, of the chosen people of God, and a leader of them at that. His Jewishness would be his identity. His eternal destiny would be staked upon his Jewishness. And patiently, Jesus wants him to see he needs something different. You need a new birth, verse 4. Nicodemus says, how can this be? Can I enter a second time in my mother's womb? He doesn't get it. Jesus explains further, verse 5, 6, and 7, to get him to see I'm talking about a second birth spiritual. There's a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Nicodemus, you need a spiritual birth. Notice he went for the root. Well, then... He uses the law lawfully. Because by verse 9, Nicodemus, we assume, understands now, okay, I need a second spiritual birth. How can these things be? And Jesus, in verse 10, answered him and said, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? And right here he's using the law lawfully in this sense. Nick, you're a a teacher. you're, You're a man of the scriptures. And you know the law. And you're to teach this to others. He says, you have fallen short here in several ways, Nicodemus. It is your duty to properly study and know the meaning of the scriptures, and you don't. And it's your duty to properly teach the meaning of those scriptures to the people, and you don't. You see, you've come short. And as you go to your law and your Old Testament scriptures, you don't properly understand them. And so he gets Nicodemus again. He's showing the air. Then he seeks to undermine what Nicodemus is trusting. And this comes out in verse 11 and 12. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, we, plural, speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness, also plural, you. And if I have told you earthly things and do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus says, we, who's the we? Well, it's either himself, the Father, and the Spirit, the Trinity. Or it could even be Jesus and his followers, the disciples. But it's plural, we, and you, plural, don't understand it. You see, Nicodemus is there, I believe, in his own mind, As an informal representative of the Pharisees, he's hoping if he can just reason with Jesus, understand him better, and so forth, he could be the bridge between what Jesus is teaching and the Pharisees who are rejecting him. So there's some good in that intention, but oh, he's so far short, isn't he? And properly understanding who Jesus is. And so he's invested in his religious tradition as a Pharisee and all that goes with it. And so Jesus says, listen, in verse 12, if I tell you earthly things and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Why should I give you more? I think he means, as a group, the Pharisees, I'm not going to give you more. But then he does. He does give Nicodemus some further light. Because I think individually, Nicodemus has a heart, has a desire for some truth. There's something here where he is listening, drawn to, understands that Jesus is from God. And so, but Nicodemus is well attached to his Pharisees, uh, Pharisaism, and he's not about to allow that to go. Okay, I'm missing a page of my notes, so now we'll be winging it. So he gives uh, Jesus some, or excuse me, Jesus gives Nicodemus some further light. Now let's look at the light that he gives him in verses 12, excuse me, 13 through 15. He says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. This is referring now to himself as coming down from heaven and the Son of Man. This is the deity of Christ. That's more light. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, referring to the story of the wilderness where they were being bitten by fiery serpents and Moses was to put a snake on a pole and hold it up and they would look at that and have physical life by simply looking. 
And he knew that story, or Jesus would assume that Nicodemus would know that story. And so he says, just like Moses was lifted up, the Son of Man, I will be lifted up. Why? Verse 15, so that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, should not perish but have eternal life. And so the light is the deity of Christ. The light involves the crucifixion of Christ, Christ being lifted up. It implies the resurrection of Christ as he's going to give life. It includes the response to the gospel, which is faith in him, and by implication would be not of works. And the result is eternal life. So he gives Nicodemus a lot of light here. Now Nicodemus wasn't ready for that. He uh, does not believe that. He does not get saved. But we know that by John chapter 7, uh, Nicodemus stands up for Jesus Christ, kind of in a weak way, amongst the Pharisees, but he's a little bit bolder. And we know that by the end of the life of Christ, that after he's crucified, it's Nicodemus who arranges for his body, uh, provides for it so that it's properly fit for burial, and arranges for his tomb through the friend of Joseph Arimathea. Most uh, commentators assume that Nicodemus is a believer here, gets saved somewhere in between John 3 and the death of Christ. Uh, Actually, probably even between John 7 and the death of Christ. So Nicodemus, slowly, the Spirit of God, whatever means, unravels his confident trust and his Jewishness and his Pharisee tradition and separates and lets that go and puts his faith in Christ. Could be at a time when he did that was when Christ was nailed to the cross. They would typically have the cross flat on the ground and put the body on it and then pound in the nails of the wrists and then the feet. And then they would lift the cross up. And it could have been right then, if Nicodemus was observing that, that that conversation on a warm night some years ago, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And whoever looks upon him, whoever believes upon him, will have eternal life. Perhaps it was then that Nicodemus understood and put his trust in Christ. So notice the approach, though. Jesus doesn't talk about being born again or your birth with anyone else, any other conversation we see in the New Testament. But he does here, very specifically with Nicodemus. As again, he knows this man, and he knows what he needs to hear. We turn now to John chapter 4, and we see our last example, the woman at the well, in John chapter 4. In verse 4, we see that it is, that he needed to go through Samaria. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Now, Samaria was a land that the Jews would avoid and reject. Samaria was the land in between Jerusalem and Galilee. Both were part of the Judea, but in the middle was Samaria. It used to be what was known as the Ten Tribes, the northern part of of, of Israel. And after Israel, they got overrun in 722, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians after. Uh, the Babylonians in particular had a come and settle here and get free land or some program as they encouraged people from all different nations in the Middle East to come and to settle and to occupy that land. And they did. And there are some Jews that remained there. And so they ended up marrying and getting, uh, becoming mixed in with these cultures and religions. And they were considered by the Jews now in Judea as half-breeds basically as untouchables. So they had nothing to do with them. They would avoid Samaria completely. If they had to go to Galilee, they usually did a big detour around Samaria. But here we see Jesus needed to go through Samaria. We see that he came to a city of Samaria. And the con- by the way, let's look at the context. The context of the story is it's side by side with Nicodemus. So we want to remember, here's Nicodemus, and now here's the woman at the well. They're side by side. We want to learn from that. We want to understand that, uh, that they're put to be uh, contrasted. And the context is, of course, we're in Samaria. Now, we want to learn about the woman. Look at what happens. We'll read uh, in verse uh, 7, or excuse me, we'll read in verse 6 at the end that there was a, we're at the sixth hour, which means we're high noon, middle of the day, the heat of the day. Verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. And the woman said, Well, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive then you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You, the Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship him. And God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So there's our conversation. Let's quickly make some observations. Let's learn about the woman. First, we know that it's high noon, and she's there alone in the heat of the day, And the women were the ones who drew water. They do, of course, almost all the work in these societies. And so they are the ones who drew the water, and they did that in the morning and in the evening. Not at high noon. This woman's an outcast. Why is a woman an outcast? If a woman is an outcast from other women, you better believe almost always it's because the other women are threatened by her. Usually her appearance or her success or attention received from other men. So she's an outcast. Second, we're going to see she's got a lot of spunk. She's got some personality, this woman does. You know, she's there at the well, and a Jewish man who is now in society and everything else looks way down upon her, says, well, you give me a drink. You would think she'd cower her head and just very quietly give him a drink, never even look at him, and scurry away. But she doesn't. She looks him straight in the face, we assume, has a conversation with him. Oh, you're a Jew, and you're asking me for a drink, me being a Samaritan. She engages conversation with him. She's not of the normal mold here. She's a thinker. You can tell. She's quick on her feet, the conversation she has, the questions, the dialogue. But we've also seen that she's been rejected. You see, men divorce women in that society. Women would never divorce a man. So she's been divorced five times, which means someone has taken her and thrown her away five times. Someone who said, I love you. Someone who gave themselves to her and then threw her away like garbage. Not once, not twice, but five times. There's a scar there, some emotional hurt. There's obviously something she's looking for, hoping for, wanting in a relationship. There's a dissatisfaction in her heart. And she's now at a point where she's just living with a man. But she also has some scriptural knowledge and some scriptural perception. As soon as Jesus gets her to see that he's talking about spiritual things, she brings up, you know, the Jews say you should worship here, and we say you should worship there. She knew the issue right away. And later, she says, I know that Messiah is coming. The Samaritans did believe and held to the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, though they rejected the rest. In those first five books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, she knew it well enough to say there is a Messiah coming. In fact, he's the Christ. And she was waiting for him. She had some faith, some spiritual perception, some knowledge. She's not an ordinary woman here. Well, so we understand about the woman. Let's observe Jesus' approach. He goes for the root. He initiates this conversation, unlike the other two. The other two initiated here. Jesus initiates And he immediately brings about the issue of water and satisfaction. I will offer you something that satisfies. As he dwells on what she's looking for. He knows her and he knows this is appealing. As he makes statements and things that draw her attention in. He then uses the law lawfully. 
as their conversation is going nicely enough, but she's not understanding the spiritual, he then says about the husband and the wives and things, he uses the la la from in the sense that, yes, she, she's, she's a sinner. In fact, she's living with a man. That's adultery currently. She's had five divorces. That's not scriptural. And she doesn't make any excuse or make a big deal out of that or try to defend that. There's no claim of self-righteousness. In fact, all he's doing here by exposing this is to get her to shift the conversation. Ah, I see you're a prophet, and they went in a spiritual direction. That's the whole reason that he does that. He doesn't say, yes, you've had five divorces, you're living with a man, now get rid of that man and change your life and clean up your act and turn. He doesn't say anything about that. Sin's not even the main issue here. He uses the law lawfully for her to recognize immediately, yes, I'm not obviously keeping that, and you are going to start talking on a spiritual level. He then clarifies what she was trusting. As this woman knew some things and had some even incomplete trust, she had incomplete knowledge and a coming Messiah. Notice how he does this. In verse 9, she says, you being a Jew. As they continue to talk, she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? In verse 12. As they continue to talk, she says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. In verse 19. As they continue to talk, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. And then verse 26, what does Jesus say? John 4, 26, he says, I who speak to you am he. And so we see that he then gives her much light. He gives her more light than he ever gave Nicodemus, or none compared to the rich young ruler. He gives one of the most profound uh, confessions of who he is to this woman at the well that he ever does anywhere else in the scripture. As he fully reveals himself, I am. She goes to town. She goes and says, look who has told me these things. Verse 28, the woman left her water pot. He went, she went her way into the city and said to the men, come. By the way, why did she say it to the men? That's who, she, who talked to her. The women are rejecting her. But she says it to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could it be the Christ? And they went out to the city and came to him. And we know as we read on, that they believed. And they heard what Christ said, and they believed, and others came. The whole village comes, the whole village rejoices, believes, and insists that Jesus stays with them. And we have two days of merriment and teaching and enjoyment. In fact, this is the highlight, the best two days of Jesus' physical ministry during the three years. Because all the other time, he's dealing with hard-headed Jews who are trying to kill him, who are asking him dumb questions over and over, who are you, who don't understand him, And here with these Samaritan Gentiles, they are praising him, wanting him to stay, understanding who he is. It started with this conversation with the woman. She left her water pot. She was satisfied. She found what she was looking for. Thinking of the context content here, Jesus Christ doesn't need to dwell on the context. She knows she's a sinner. He does clarify some of the content, especially that he is Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ. He does give her the response, whoever drinks of this water in the air is tense, and the result will never thirst again. Eternal satisfaction. So what are some principles we can learn from Jesus as he has these three conversations? We can first see that we're not restricted by cultural boundaries. Jesus didn't care if she was a Samaritan. Neither should we. The gospel's for everyone. Secondly, when evangelizing, we're to have personal conversations. We don't just, one question, boom, we now go on for 27 minutes about everything we know. Let's hear them. Let's find out some things. Let's learn about what they believe. There's some interaction here. We also would, uh, number three, we're to address the central issues and carefully stay focused. There's many tangents Jesus could have gone on here about Jerusalem, the temple, where to worship, why the Samaritans are this. He could have gone on about Nicodemus, about some finer points of Phariseeism. He stayed focused on the central issue, though he did uh, avoid, and he also avoided being combative. And we can do this because we're believers. We're, we feel passionately about what we believe in, and we can then become almost just combative, and it's terrible. Forgetting that we're to love these people, we're to give them time. We often didn't understand things right away. 
And just be patient with people. Don't be combative. But at the same time, you're going to have to assert truth and point out error. You're going to have to be able to say if they're believing something that's going to hinder them from believing the gospel to point that out. But again, it's not with combativeness, and it's done in light of a conversation. And that finally means we need to know our material well. You see, God wants us to be flexible with the gospel. No two encounters are the same. There's not cookie-cutter evangelism here. Yes, the message is the same, the content, the context, the response, the result. But how those things come out, the conversations, what you emphasize, the illustrations, the verses, they're going to vary. And they're going to vary as you learn the person you're talking to and you understand who they are and what it is that they're, what they're about. As we think of the value of knowing someone and knowing their need, couldn't help, I just thought I'd share this piece of, uh, I guess it's called poetry here, related to the woman at the well. We'll do this in closing this morning. I am a woman of no distinction, of little importance. I am a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't really take the time to look at me or even get to know me, for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and otherwise what's the point in doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face and not just see two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, loves, and fears. That's too much to hope for, to wish for, or pray for, so I don't, not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain Pain. that keeps me in my own private jail, the pain that's brought me here at midday to this well. To ask for a drink is no big request, but to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used and abused, an outcast, a failure, a disappointment, a sinner, no drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning, as I'm sure you condemn me now, but... You don't. You're a man of no distinction, though of the utmost importance, a man with little reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me. But don't need to get to know me, for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And you know me. You actually know me. All of me and everything about me. Every thought inside and hair on top of my head. Every hurt stored up. Every hope. Every dread. My past and my future. All I am and could be. You tell me everything. You tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another would bring hate and condemnation. Coming from you brings love, grace, mercy, hope, and salvation. I've heard of one to come who would save a wretch like me. And here in my presence you say I am he. To be known is to be loved. And to be loved is to be known. And I just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, sinners and saints, who should hear what you've told me, who should see what you've shown me, who should taste what you gave me, who should feel how you forgave me. For to be known is to be loved. And to be loved is to be known. And they all need this too. We all do need it for our own. So you can see the value of audience awareness, where someone's at, what they're looking for, what they're hungering for. How it was different for the rich young ruler, it was different for Nicodemus, it was different for the woman at the well. And when we're trusting the Lord, and the Spirit of God is free to work, we can understand the value of audience awareness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these examples of Jesus Christ and sharing with others. We thank you, Father, how he loves all. And we pray, Father, that that would be our motive as well. That we have a very, very excellent and precious message that all need to hear. That we'd be willing to cross over normal boundaries, social customs, etc. We'd be willing, Father, to get to know people, converse, understand them, and by your grace, with your wisdom, be able to even penetrate and tailor the gospel message by way of emphasis, illustration, verse, points, that we might be more effective. Because we do, Father, have indeed good news from you to us, and we do want to be faithful in presenting that and sharing that. So thank you for this time of study this morning now, and we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Kurt. That was very helpful, whether we're sharing the gospel with our neighbor or at a, a survey table at the universities or at a fair or even maybe some foreign uh, crew members on a cruise ship. Very beneficial words. Thank you. I'd like to close our service today with Lord, I Need You. Please remember our uh, pastor in prayer, Teo and uh, Nelson, and uh, even others that I reminded you about earlier tonight or today. Lord, I need you. Would you please stand? We'll sing together. Lord, I need you when the sea of life is calm oh lord i need you when the wind is blowing strong whether trials come or cease keep me always on my knees lord i need you lord i need you Sometimes when life seems gentle and blessings flow my way, I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward. With words you long to hear, Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you. When the wind is blowing strong, whether trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, help me to remember I'm weak, but you are strong. I cannot sing apart from you, for Lord, you are my song. Although I'm prone to wonder and boast in all I do, Lord, keep my eyes turned upward, so I depend on you. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you. When